Midnight Facts for Insomniac. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. It's just, my point is, like, saying you're of sound mind does not make it true and no. is demonstrably false based on the action that you're involved in right now. Based on the action of you signing the document. Yeah, it's meaningless. Yeah. I, being of sound mind, do hereby stipulate that pigs shall fly and astroturf waffle catnip. <laughs> Just as meaningful. I don't know what's going on right now, Duncan. I don't know if Mercury is in retrograde or if this house was built on an Indian burial ground, but my life is officially off the rails. Okay. And I don't want to talk about it. This is, <laughs> Miffy is my happy place. But okay. I love that you're like, everything is fucked and I'm not talking about it. Well, I bring it up for a reason. Okay. So this is, my point is just trust me when I say that I am justified in being selfish this week. Okay. We will definitely get around to the topic that all of the insomniacs voted on in the discord. I promise. I'm actually looking forward to that one. I think it'll be fun. But this week I am hijacking the show. I'm mm. going rogue. I'm picking my own subject. We're doing my thing. So, I don't know if you saw these, but I remember this as a kid really clearly. I remember seeing these ads on TV for a book called Dianetics. Do you remember those? Oh, sweet, good Lord fuck. Are we doing Scientology? So those ads always seemed very mysterious to me. Mm. There was a volcano erupting vigorously. One of them had this giant wall of spikes raising up in front of this guy who was walking. It was like blocking his path. And then the volcano very dramatically exploded the wall in front of him. Huh. Some of the ads would just be a list of questions along with page numbers that apparently held the answers to those questions. They were questions like, how can you reach your full potential? Mm. And one of the taglines for the ad was the owner's manual for the human mind. Uh, you know, soft note, owner's manuals notoriously difficult to figure out. Well, I mean, that makes sense because the human mind notoriously complicated. Yes. So that book, it turns out, is the foundation of a hugely successful worldwide profit-making business slash cult known as Scientology. And the book was written by one of history's most prolific authors and successful cult leaders who had become known to his followers as LRH. Mm. Mm -hmm. Here is a sample from the first section of the book. Have you read any of Dianetics? No, no, I won't let it anywhere near my mind meets. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm giving you the manual for your mind. So here is a sample from the first section of Dianetics. Quote, The skills offered in this handbook will produce the Dianetic Clear, an optimum individual with intelligence considerably greater than the current normal. The clear, referring to a person who has achieved that state, has full color visio, tone sonic, tactile, olfactory, rhythmic, kinesthetic, thermal, and organic imagination in kind. Oh, okay. I started hearing, you know, like halfway through that. Some of those aren't even words, mm. uh, let alone realistic concepts. But regardless, going clear is the stated goal of Scientology. Mm. And if that sounds a little bit ridiculous and far-fetched, you might be surprised to learn how many prominent celebrities have been ensnared by what is often described as the world's youngest major religion. And I use the word ensnared deliberately. To be clear, so to speak, I'm not going to pretend to be impartial in this one. We can discuss whether Scientology is ultimately worse than any other religion. I think that's a valid conversation to have. Yeah. But the bottom line is that this organization is a horribly exploitive, money-grubbing cult. And I am confident that I'll convincingly make that case by the end of this episode. Fair. And if not, you know what? They are actively recruiting. Just <laughs> The church claims to have some 4 million members, but more realistic estimates put the membership between like 20,000 and 50,000. It's not, that's like miffy levels. I mean, we're getting to the point, like we're, we're going to, we're going to outpace Scientology not too far in the future here. Mm. But uh, the problem is, uh, you know, they, they have a lot more money. Yeah. And we'll yeah, explain yeah. why. Mm. And their membership is dropping rapidly. So they are desperate to recruit at this point. Your, your color visio tone sonic kinesthetic thermal organic imagination awaits <laughs> such a ridiculous like <laughs> string of phrases i can't that's what i mean like i just got verbal static after a while through that sentence you originally said like i was like wait that's not those aren't words it sounds like something on a they, they created for a disney ride or something yeah this is definitely like walt disneyfied language it's just like experience the color visio tone sonic you know then it's like abraham lincoln like twitchily reading a book and flapping his jaw weirdly or something Four score and seven years ago. Right. They do have a pretty sweet website. Uh, you can type in your location, by the way, and it will show you all of the churches nearby. So that's cool. It's kind of like the Sex Predator website where mm. you can like see how close you are and you will be shocked. There is a Church of Scientology on Mission Street about five minutes from your house. 
Sweet. There are six of them in the San Jose area, just over the hill from here, not far from the Bay Area. Uh-huh. What's funny, though, is that most of these places are just empty, like 24-7. They mm. build buildings obsessively. Scientology mm. has all this money. They invest in a ton of land and property. And then these places just sit with, like, one person in a dusty office. So much of it is just for show and to make it seem like they're still expanding and also for, like, basically money laundering, just places to stick all their money. Mm. And uh, there's, like, no one going in and out. It's really creepy and weird. That sounds like a CIA front. They're just buying somewhere and just having one person sit there and having thousands of dollars move through it a week. It's a cult front. Yeah. It's just that's what they do is they build these buildings and they expand, expand, expand. And meanwhile, you know, they're contracting, contracting, contracting when it comes to actual number of people that hmm. care about this shit. Because now with the internet, anyone can look this up and be like, oh, wait, Xenu, I think I'm out. And we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, though, that this is not just some obscure Hollywood celebrity networking club, although it is that as well. Uh, obviously, Tom Cruise and John Travolta are the two biggest poster boys, but they share poster space with Giovanni Ribisi, uh, Juliette Lewis, Kirsty Alley from Cheers, the musician Beck, and the late jazz musician Chick Corea, uh, Elizabeth Moss from The Handmaid's Tale and Get Him to the Greek and Us, hmm. Michael Pena, the super talented and funny comedic actor from Ant-Man and Fantasy Island and Chips, uh, Jenna Elfman from Dharma and Greg, actor and accused rapist Danny Masterson, uh, Jason Lee, the skateboarder and frequent collaborator of Kevin Smith in Mallrats and Chasing Amy. No, they didn't get him. You know, he was in Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise, and I guarantee that's where it happened. Okay, that's, I was going to say, yeah. I made that connection in my head after a while. I was like, why Jason Lee? And I was like, oh, he did a fucking movie with Tom Cruise. Mm. Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson, is a devout Scientologist. She has donated over $10 million to the church. Uh, Singer-songwriter Isaac Hayes, the voice of Chef in South Park. He actually quit after the famous South Park episode making fun of Scientology. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I do remember that. Rapper Doug E. Fresh. I'm not familiar with his work, but okay. Nicole Kidman slash Katie Holmes slash any woman who has dated or married Tom Cruise's toxic ass. (laughs) They all become temporary Scientologists and then ditch the church immediately after escaping from Tom. Really? So they've all left the church? All of them have left the church. In fact, even the woman who got Tom Cruise into Scientology, which was his first wife, Mimi Rogers. Huh. She's the reason Tom Cruise is in Scientology. Even she has left the church. Tom is sticking it out. Wow. Yeah. Breaking up with Tom Cruise, it's like an obstacle course. There are like multiple steps. You mm-hmm. don't just break up with Tom. You have to like get out of this freaking cult. Yeah. And he, he sleeps like a vampire. So very lightly. So make sure you yeah. practice your ninja walk before you try and ghost out the room. Also, uh, Leah Remini from King of Queens, and who I had a huge crush on as a teenager, she was famously a Scientologist for years and now is famously a vocal opponent of the church. She has produced various documentaries and a TV series with the goal of exposing and undermining Scientology. Hmm. Her content, not great in my opinion. It's okay. Hmm. Like, there's some interesting stuff. The best possible source, though, if you're interested in learning more, is called Going Clear, both the HBO documentary and even more so the book, Uh, called Going Clear, Scientology, Hollywood, and the Prison of Belief. It's really good. Really? Okay. Very thorough. So Lafayette Ronald Hubbard was born in Nebraska in 1911. His father was in the Navy, which would afford opportunities for Hubbard to travel extensively as a younger man. He kept journals of his travels, as any young aspiring writer would, jotting down all of his philosophical musings. Uh, When he went to China, for instance, he wrote this philosophical musing, Quote, the trouble with China is there are too many chinks here. Cool. I think that is the essence of cringe. I'm not sure, but I feel like that is the distillation. Well, if you think that's cringy, uh, it was also around this time that Hubbard gave himself the nickname Flash. (sighs) So it seems like he was never not awful. Yeah. Like, you know, some people start out mostly good and then become terrible over time due to circumstances outside of their control. Right. Uh, Others are just naturals it's a natural piece of shit yeah i got you i got you he seems like a natural born incel from what you're describing yeah flash had some incel energy (laughs) he did for sure he's got an incel vibe (laughs) rocking so when he was 22 hubbard married a woman named margaret louise grubb nicknamed polly (laughs) of course she was and what the fuck is him pairing up with another person with three names can you have a last name nickname? Because I just it's funny that like they nicknamed her Polly. Margaret was not the problem. Mm. Margaret's a fine name. Yeah. It's Grub was the issue. Mm. She, so now she's Polly Grub. I don't think that's any better. 
<laughs> that sounds like nickname her. should serve a purpose. I mean, it sounds like it did. She was she was like, I am multiple grubs, sir. <laughs> the Hubbards settled in Maryland and had two children, a boy and a girl. So Hubbard got his start back when writers were paid a penny a word to churn out content for pulp magazines. The famous rumor at the time is that Hubbard typed so quickly and intently that he would sweat all over his typewriter. Which is kind of foul. You. He is actually the Guinness record holder for most number of books published at 1,084. Fucking what? And that means exactly what you think it means. Like 90% of this guy's writing was absolute trash. <laughs> not good. Define published. Like people bought the shit or people like, like did he self-publish? No, no. He was churning them out back in the day. Huh. Hubbard's prolific writing resulted in some minor success and even a short-lived TV serial based on one of his works called The Secret of Treasure Island. But his Hollywood career never took off, so he instead attempted to follow in his father's footsteps and serve in the Navy. But his poor eyesight and other health problems proved a barrier to entry. He failed his physical numerous times, but then there was the attack on Pearl Harbor, and suddenly the standards for the Navy dropped to breath and a pulse. Hubbard's short career in the Navy is extensively documented, so we know exactly what happened and what didn't, and it is also extensively mythologized by the Church of Scientology. Hmm. Hubbard claimed to have sunk two Japanese submarines, but the truth was that he was discharged after the submarine he was commanding opened fire on a log and then accidentally attacked a Mexican island. <laughs> Hubbard was, in fact, a serial liar throughout his life. He would inflate the tales of his military service. For instance, he claimed to have been severely injured in combat and would later swear that Scientology had cured him. But the fact is that the only ailments he experienced during his years of service were mild arthritis and pink eye. Hubbard was also a serial womanizer and cheater, so you can add gonorrhea to his list of ailments, which he picked up from a prostitute in Miami. Quote, she was a very loose person, unquote. That prostitute, not, not very monogamous. She was, <laughs> he was really upset about that. Yeah, it's really. Super disloyal. <laughs> I paid her $100. You'd I, think that would gain me something. I suspect she may be seeing other customers. <laughs> It's like going into a Denny's and being like, I feel like this waitress isn't just seeing me. Of his STD, Hubbard wrote, quote, I was terrified by it. The consequences of being discovered by my wife, the Navy, my friends. I took to dosing myself with sulfa, which uh, not sulfur, sulfa, S-U-L-F-A, mm -hmm. in such quantities that I was afraid it had affected my brain. I mean, you're not wrong. I'm no doctor, but mm. uh, it did. Yeah. Gonna if, go with yes. If we're giving him the benefit of the doubt, hmm. Flash was already not doing great before the sulfa. Yeah. So maybe maybe he can't use that as an excuse. No. And and the fact that he was a serial uh uh you know philanderer, how did he pull that off looking like he did with with how he was? Oh right, he paid for it. So probably maybe more than one. He was also, I mean, let's give him his due. He was very charismatic. Like the hmm. guy started a fucking religion. Right. So I mean, I've seen video. I don't get it. It doesn't come across very well in video, mm. I think. But uh, throughout his life, he would have a strange effect on people and be very magnetic. Mm. So after his discharge from the military, Hubbard abandoned his wife and two children to move to Los Angeles, where he dabbled in some weird mystical sex magic. That's not a joke. He fell in with noted rocket scientist, mystic, and science fiction enthusiast Jack Parsons, who is a follower of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orienti, these are adherents of Thelema, the black magic religion founded by Aleister Crowley. We've talked about Thelema. Yeah. So this gets pretty bonkers, but is absolutely true. The group resided in a giant mansion that Parsons had divided up and was renting as individual rooms. It was basically like a black magic sex commune. Parsons and Hubbard devised a number of so-called sex magic rituals, one of which was explicitly intended to produce the moon child, a boy who would grow up to become the Antichrist. Oh, goody. It took a while to find a willing uh, host, but that didn't stop them from practicing. Mm. Quote, the ceremony, likely aided by narcotics and hallucinogens, required Hubbard to channel the female deity of Babylon as Parsons performed the invocation of wand with material basis on talisman. In other words, masturbating on a piece of parchment. Mahala. He typically invoked twice a night. I mean, if that's all we're calling it, I could probably evoke maybe three, four times a day, but... You don't you do not do this with your buddies? That's no. just bonding. Eventually, a woman named Marjorie Cameron agreed to birth the moon child slash antichrist, and it probably had nothing to do with the prospect of free rent. Mm. Quote, as Hubbard continued the incantation, Parsons and Cameron consummated the ceremony upon the altar. This same ritual went on for three nights in a row. Afterward, Parsons wrote to Crowley, 
Instructions were received direct through Ron the Seer. I am to act as instructor guardian guide for nine months. Then it, the baby, will be loosed on the world. Unquote. <laughs> Crowley, it seems, was unimpressed. Quote, apparently Parsons or Hubbard or somebody is producing a moon child, he complained to another follower. Quote, I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these goats. Yeah, I, I've never once read or heard of Crowley being like, oh, man, that sect we have in L.A. is really killing it. They've birthed the Antichrist through this series of gobbledygook ceremonies and fucking a lot. This was his equivalent of I cannot sanction that buffoonery. E exactly. <laughs> The moon child would never come to fruition. When Marjorie actually got pregnant, an abortion was quickly procured, presumably because Parsons and Hubbard realized that a tiny, wailing, diaper-soiling antichrist can really put a damper on your bachelor sex magic pad. I mean, and the fact that if it summoned any sort of demons or, you know, threw a gargoyle off a church onto somebody, it would be hard to explain. You're worried about liability. Issues. Yeah, You're really. Like, yeah, we gotta rethink this. <laughs> Can't insure that kind of shit. Over time, Parsons became increasingly disenchanted with Hubbard when good old Randy Ron began having affairs with numerous women in the house, including Jack's girlfriend, Sarah Northrup, a teenage second-degree magician who had already caused quite a bit of drama in the house to the point that Alistair Crowley referred to her as a vampire and implied that she was an evil seductress. Hmm. I think she was just a dramatic teenager who was being told she was a second-degree magician. That's not going to end well. No, it's a recipe for disaster. Jack Parsons was jealous of the affair between Hubbard and Sarah Northrup, but tried to save face in his correspondence with Alistair Crowley, writing, quote, Although Betty and I are still friendly, she has transferred her sexual attraction to Ron. I think I've made a great gain, and as Betty and I are the best of friends, there is little loss. I cared for her rather deeply, but I have no desire to control her emotions, and I can, I hope, control my own. I need a magical partner. I have many experiments in mind. Yeah, you got cuckolded and then friend zone, bro. Let's just call it what it is. Another of their experiments was not remotely magical. Hubbard and Jack would attempt to go into business together with some harebrained boat selling scheme, but Hubbard would eventually break the agreement, steal $10,000 from Jack, and run off with Sarah Northrup to Miami to claim the boats for himself. After learning of the treachery, Alistair Crowley mocked Jack Parsons for being a sucker, prompting Parsons to take action. Quote, Hubbard attempted to escape me by sailing at 5 p.m., and I performed a full evocation to Bartzabel, the spirit of Mars or war, within the circle at 8 p.m. At the same time, so far as I can check, his ship was struck by a sudden squall off the coast, which ripped off his sails and forced him back to port, where I took the boat in custody. However, I am afraid that most of the money has already been dissipated. That's the word I'm going to use if I steal money mm. and then spend it. I'm sorry, that money has dissipated. I like how it implies zero responsibility. Right. It's just an electrical <laughs> charge. You just left it too long. It dissipated. That money has been aerosoled. It was, it was the weirdest thing. <laughs> I, I remember I went to a strip club. I was there for about 10 hours. Uh, by the end of the night, poof. I met someone I think named Candy Cadillac. I don't know. But And then the money disappeared. It's a mystery. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. When black magic didn't have the intended effect, Jack tried a more pedestrian approach. He sued Hubbard, and they settled out of court. Hmm. I bet he still chalked this modest victory up to magic. <laughs> to Bartholomew, or whoever the fuck it was. By, via the casting of a powerful sorceress hex within a flaming pentagram of lamb's blood, I was able to obtain a fiduciary settlement for a fraction of the money I was owed. <laughs> Hail Satan! Hail Satan! <laughs> oh my god. Incidentally, the Church of Scientology does officially acknowledge that Hubbard was involved with Thelema and the OTO, but they claim that he was acting on behalf of the U.S. government as a spy infiltrating the organization. Quote, Mr. Hubbard accomplished the assignment, the church maintains. He engineered a business investment that tied up the money Parsons used to fund the group's activities, thus making it unavailable to Parsons for his occult pursuits. I mean, that's a great way of framing stealing $10,000 from a jackass. It was the noblest of thefts. Yes, seriously. <laughs> Hubbard, the church claims, quote, broke up black magic in America, unquote. Until the 1980s and the satanic panic, at which point... He was nowhere to be found. So yeah, Hubbard banged a bunch of wannabe magicians, assisted with black magic jerk-off sessions, and then defrauded his friends, all in the name of patriotism. Oh, I mean, let's not forget spoke gibberish poetry while two of them banged it out. It's a hero, really. He, <laughs> just really, he deserves a medal. Some of us served our country by fighting the Nazis. Uh, some of us fucked witches. <laughs> we don't kink shame. We don't. <laughs> We don't, however, award medals for witch banging. I don't know. It's kind of weird. 
We should. I mean, <laughs> now that you say it. I was involved in the witch bang of 93. You don't understand, man. I think even if you're like fourth place in that, you're you're still a winner. Still a winner. <laughs> Did you come out with your balls and your back unscratched? Winner. If your back isn't scratched, it wasn't, it wasn't no, that good. That's fair. As it turned out, Sarah Northrup and L. Ron Hubbard's honeymoon period would be short. They immediately experienced relationship problems. That is a mild way of putting it. Hmm. In Sarah's own words, quote, We had this terrible fight, and he told me he was going to commit suicide if I didn't marry him. I really believed him, so we got married. <laughs> Romance. <laughs> When the moon hits your eye like a suicide, that's amore. Like, what fucking what? The marriage was abusive from the jump. Hubbard once struck Sarah with a forty-five caliber revolver across the face because she was smiling in her sleep, which he interpreted to mean that she was thinking of someone else. Okay, so fully sane. It's pretty telling when you assume that every time your wife is smiling, she could only be picturing someone other than you. <laughs> He, he knew how awful he was, mm. like subconsciously or consciously. Mm. Quote, he said he would kill me rather than let me leave him, unquote. Hubbard was now legally married to two women, an official bigamist, a thief, a liar, basically the perfect messiah and purest vessel for a brand new religion. <laughs> the only thing he's missing is, you know, water that magically turns into vino de table. Again, in Sarah's own words, quote, he said many times that the only way to make any real money was to have a religion, unquote. I mean, he's not wrong. Yeah, he's just, you know, what do they say in The Big Lebowski? You're not wrong, Walter. You're, You're just, just an, an asshole. asshole. Weirdly, you won't find any of this in the official Scientology literature. Hmm. The abusive bigamy and calculating con man stuff is not prominently featured on their website or any of their recruitment tools. Weird. I feel like hitting a sleeping woman across the face with a 45 caliber revolver would be a tab on there. After the birth of their first child in 1950, Hubbard began working on what would become Dianetics, the modern science of mental health. Essentially a self-help book of pseudoscientific pop psychology, a book which claimed that you could think away cancer and arthritis, and also vilified homosexuals as dangerous deviants. Quote, the sexual pervert, and by this term, Dianetics includes any and all forms of deviation, such as homosexuality, lesbianism, sexual sadism, is actually quite ill physically. He is very far from culpable for his condition, but he is also far from normal and extremely dangerous to society. Okay. Much of the content of the book reminds me of those personality tests that we covered in episode 92. Oh, yeah. In fact, Scientology would later include its own, quote, assessment, which it calls the Oxford Capacity Analysis, to make it sound scientific, of course, it has nothing to do with Oxford. Yeah, I was going to say. And just like all those frauds we discussed in the personality test episode, Hubbard was a guy with no psychiatric training, purporting to teach people how to understand their minds, control their brains and emotions, and better their lives. Yeah, I, and I can't help but really appreciate the uh, hypocrisy of somebody who'd smacked somebody across the face while they were sleeping with a gun and threatened to commit suicide before getting married. Yeah, you are the peak Worry about those gay folk, because you are the peak of mental health. Oh, it gets even better, because he wrote so many books on successful marriage, and that's one thing that Scientology has really touted, is their ability to, like, handle couples therapy, basically keeping relationships together. I mean, I guess they successfully can keep some relationships together. With a forty-five, ain't no one going to leave. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> that's called a forty-five caliber ring, baby. <laughs> so Hubbard was like a guru, a pseudoscientist, and a life coach, all rolled into one rubbery-lipped, wife-beating con man. So, of course, his book went viral. Hmm. As we learned with The Secret, people enjoy being told that they are secretly powerful wizards and that magic is real. In Dianetics, named for dia, which is Greek for through, and nous, meaning mind. Through the mind, I guess. I don't know. Hubbard posited that the human brain is split between two conflicting personas, so to speak. The analytical and the reactive mind. Basically, he claimed that the brain is a perfect calculating machine, but over time it becomes cluttered and filled up with traumas that need to be cleared out. These traumatic experiences are encoded in the human brain as, quote, engrams, E-N-G-R-A-M-S, and only someone trained as an auditor, which is the Dianetics equivalent of a therapist, could help identify and clear out those engrams. Mm. Now, engrams weren't limited to conscious experience. For instance, engrams could involve the trauma that a person had experienced as an embryo by being subjected to the sexual activity of its parents. 
Oh, wow. So the hypocrisy goes even deeper. He's like, wait, wait, wait. So while my buddy, the Satanist, was banging it out with his <laughs> pregnant girlfriend, he was creating trauma in that poor little antichrist. Oh, little antichrist. Yeah, I also love the, like, shaming here. Yeah. Just, you hear that, mm. pregnant ladies? Better keep the P out of the V. You don't want to mess up your B. <laughs> B being baby. Yeah, like, I got it. Not like butthole. <laughs> Hubbard would also claim that embryos were frequently traumatized by abortion attempts. Quote, It is a scientific fact that abortion attempts are the most important factor in aberration. The child on whom the abortion is attempted is condemned to live with murderers, whom he reactively knows to be murderers, through all his weak and helpless youth. Exclamation point. He was very adamant about this, yes. <laughs> I, I also love that abortion attempts... Who is attempting this and not completing it? Like, if it's a doctor, you are aborted, sir. Apparently, in Hubbard's mind, just millions of women were constantly attempting and failing to abort babies. It seems like the lesson here is that if you're going to get an abortion, just be thorough. Yeah. It's not even an anti-abortion message. No, it's just, it's, just, it's more like, t carry that abortion to completion, sir. Yeah, it seems like he's just encouraging doctors to get better at abortion. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Of course, Hubbard himself would be responsible for numerous abortions of fetuses that he himself had created and would later pressure members of his sea organization to terminate pregnancies in order to keep the population of the boats manageable. We will get there. Okay. So no hypocrisy here. None. None whatsoever. I'm, I'm thinking he's five by five all the way through. All of this in-womb trauma nonsense did not endear Hubbard to the psychiatric establishment. He and his book would be rejected and mocked by most noted psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and in return, Hubbard began to despise the entire field. He bore a grudge against an entire scientific discipline. Another contributing factor to his salt and shade was that he had actually suffered from some pretty extreme mental anguish at various times in his life, and there are documented letters in which he begged therapists to provide treatment, and he felt that they had either rebuffed him or failed. <laughs> the hell you say? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I, I don't know if I can treat you since you've accepted none of your issues as actual issues. You're mostly just sad and want me to make you better. He would eventually write that if psychiatrists, quote, had the power to torture and kill everyone, they would do so. He continued, quote, recognize them for what they are, psychotic criminals, and handle them accordingly. So not bitter. Not a drama queen at all. Mm. He wasn't exaggerating. No, I mean, he seems truly in grasp of reality at all times. Hubbard's extreme hatred of psychiatry explains why, even to this day, Scientology is antagonistic toward traditional therapy and psychiatric treatments. I don't know if you've ever seen those crazy interviews with Tom Cruise where he, like, goes off on therapists and antidepressants. It is pretty intense. They hate psychiatry. Mm. Scientologists like to portray auditors versus psychologists as if they're like dogs and cats. They're just like natural enemies. But in reality, it's this weird one-sided hatred where Scientologists are super bitter and spend all their time despising psychiatry, while psychiatrists just don't know what the hell an auditor is. <laughs> that sounds like every lonely, angry person I've ever met. I hate you. Who are you? So the Dianetics equivalent of the therapist, auditors, they utilize what's known as an E-meter to try to identify malicious engrams or destructive memories within the mind, as mentioned. An E-meter is basically a stripped-down lie detector. The patient or subject is encouraged to talk about incidents from their past while holding onto two metal cans, which are supposed to measure the intensity of electrical impulses. And supposedly those impulses should spike when an engram is detected. Hmm. Scientologists claim that the meter is actually detecting the physical weight of human thought, which is fully as bonkers as it sounds, but not nearly as bonkers as it's going to get. Oh, so this is the lighter side of bonkers. Mm. Okay. Xenu awaits. <laughs> God. So when the auditor detected an engram, uh, he or she would ask the subject to divulge more about that experience or memory to try to discharge some of the energy behind it. There is some benefit to this. It's basically exposure therapy. This is like gradually exposing yourself to traumatic thoughts and memories until they lose their power. That's a time-tested technique. Yeah, that's essentially just therapy, That's man. called therapy. Yeah. Ultimately, there probably are some benefits to experiencing auditing. It's very cathartic. Hmm. It's like Catholic confession. You're just getting stuff off your chest. And of course, that's going to make you feel lighter. You know, your heavy thoughts aren't weighing you down, metaphorically, except that Scientologists would say literally because they're fucking crazy. Right. The goal of Dianetics and Scientology was to erase your reactive mind completely so that you became a creature of logic, at which point you would go fully, quote, clear and become a superhuman. Your ills would mysteriously heal themselves. You would be impervious to sickness. Suck it, gonorrhea. <laughs> 
you will never disrupt my sex magic again. <laughs> and it all comes back to that one loose woman who he paid for. <laughs> Now, of course, just like we discussed in our episode Modern Quackery, when mm. we talked about the secret, the problem with claiming that the mind is a magical Harry Potter wand, of course, means that any Scientologist who gets sick is failing to live up to their magical potential. Right. They're demonstrating that they are incapable of becoming fully clear. Sickness is really just weakness and personal failure. So again, it's victim blaming. Right. This is why Tom Cruise is such a freaking nut job who does his own stunts and can't admit that he's getting older and refuses to stop when he gets hurt. If you're declared clear and then you appear in public with an injury or with the sniffles, that's like literally a threat to the entire religion. You've become both a liability and an embarrassment because the only possibilities are that the religion is a lie or that you failed and aren't actually clear. I mean, couldn't there be a third option where your, your, your reactive mind simply came back and you're feeling a surge of reactive mind? Like, haven't they come up with better lies than this? No, because that's the whole point. It's like the reactive mind is gone. And so if it comes back, then Scientology doesn't work. The whole point is to get rid of that reactive mind for good. Yeah, this is clearly thought up by a second-rate sci-fi mind. Dianetics sold millions of copies and was on the bestseller list for over 100 weeks straight. It was a national sensation. But with great success comes great scrutiny. Hmm. I think that's, is that the Spider-Man quote? Yeah, that's actually verbatim what Uncle What's-His-Fuck said. I don't think it was. No, probably not. No. Hubbard's book claimed that going clear was the key to unlocking these superhuman abilities, and all throughout Dianetics are assertions that Hubbard's theories are scientifically proven. So, the natural question is, where are all the superhumans? Right. If Hubbard had proof that his techniques worked, there had to be at least a few 4.0s in the world. I'm not going to get super deep into this, but Hubbard would eventually explain that a clear was someone who had registered a 4.0 on the tone scale. Hmm. The tone scale is a way of categorizing and gauging a person's level of enlightenment, basically. It's like a hotness scale for the soul. <laughs> nah, bro, don't date her. She's only a 2.5. You can do better. Hubbard theorized that the scale could go all the way up to 40 and claimed that a person achieving those higher levels would have powers that even he could not fully imagine. Hmm. Most of us lowly unclears are registering in the low twos and threes, but one of the defining characteristics of anyone at four or above, apart from immunity to germs, is that they could supposedly recall in perfect detail any image or particular moment from their lives. Basically, photographic memories. Edactic memory? Is that what it's called? It's called not a real thing, as okay. we learned in one of our other episodes. That's not something that anyone has. Some people use their like memory palace and everything to get really good at accessing certain information but no one can recall every single moment from their lives it's just not possible right but that presented a problem for hubbard because now that dianetics had gone mainstream and promised results in as little as 20 hours you know there had to be all these mental supermen and superwomen just roaming around just not taking credit for it or something you know right. they were probably so humble because they were also perfect human beings and wouldn't be prideful right but under pressure to produce evidence Hubbard revealed at a press conference in Los Angeles the first supposed clear, a physics student named Sonia Bianca. Quote, The audience began peppering her with questions, such as what she had for breakfast eight years before, or what was on this particular page of Hubbard's book, or even elemental formulas in physics, which was her area of specialty. She was incapable of responding when someone asked the color of Hubbard's necktie when he briefly had his back turned to her. It was a very public fiasco. Unquote. Oh, his nose. <laughs> you, you remember the the uh, the debunking quacks or like you know, the, the mystical fuckery with like the spoon bender who we mm -hmm. mocked getting Yuri Geller, his, yeah. Yuri Geller, yeah, getting his asshole torn out by the other guy. What was his magical Mike or whatever the fuck his name was? <laughs> magical. <laughs> he was not a male stripper, actually. He was quite a d adorable old man. Yeah, a respectable not, old man. I would not want to see him. I can't remember his name. In so. his skivvies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, you no. would. That was, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, see, I almost said, like, the amazing Jonathan, and yeah. it's not. That's a different guy. Yeah, it was like the effervescent fuckwitter. I, don't, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and getting debunked by effervescent fuckwit is particularly <laughs> insulting <laughs> for anyone who can bend spoons with their mind. Was Randy, I think. The, yeah, the amazing Randy. The amazing Randy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th that, to me, is like watching the amazing Randy tear Yuri Geller a new asshole. Yeah. But impromptu and 
she's not you don't know anything about her in fact i would i would bet large sums of money in vital parts of my anatomy that she didn't know he was going to name her when she went up there and like sat on the dais with him no i'm pretty sure he had like coached her and really thought he had this under control i do feel bad for her because mm. i believe i think she believed that she had gone clear mm. and was probably really shocked when she could not remember the color of his tie and was like uh-oh uh oh, short term to long term memory storage bad. Like maybe this book is bullshit, mm. and uh, I'm feeling a little silly right now. And Hubbard was, uh, but I, I would love to have seen Hubbard try to weasel his way out of this bullshit. How uh, magnetic are you now, motherfucker? Jesus, fuck that guy. <laughs> Ultimately, however, it wasn't scientific debunking that led to the fall of Dianetics. It was cultural fickleness. Just like any other fad, it had its moment, and by 1952, that moment had passed. Within two years of the publication of Dianetics, the HDR Foundation was bankrupt, and Hubbard was once again evading creditors. At that point, he even lost the rights to the book Dianetics, and he would regain it later. Oh, wow. Okay. But by this time, Hubbard had bought into his own hype. And of course, with all the nonsense he was spewing about superhumans, he had to project an image of perfection, even though he was a snaggletoothed, ugly fuck. As his ego grew, so did his paranoia. Mm. He believed that the psychiatric profession as a whole was now out to get him, that they saw him as competition and were trying to have him institutionalized. They probably were trying <laughs> to have him, but, but for different reasons. Yeah, but I feel like probably. institutionalization would have been really helpful for him, yeah. but yet yeah, it wasn't because they saw him as a threat to their profession. No, they saw him more as a threat to women's faces with his, you know, 45. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Sarah's words again, he degenerated into a really paranoid, terrifying person. When she threatened to leave him, Hubbard kidnapped their child and fled to Cuba. Quote, he called me and told me that he had killed her. He said he had cut her into little pieces and dropped those pieces into a river. Unquote. You're right. They're only trying to 5150 <laughs> you because they're jealous. Ah, so amazing. Like, this is not just... It's not only that he's just a normal guy. Like, it's it's bad enough when normal people claim that they're, like, mystical, you know, supermen or something. Right. But, like, he's the worst person in the world claiming to be a advanced, perfect human. Right. If he's the perfect human, please, God, make me into a cow. <laughs> right. After Sarah learned that Hubbard had secretly returned to the United States, she sued him for custody, at which point he accused his wife of being a communist to try to get her arrested, because this was during the Red Scare. Uh, he said, quote, I'm a public figure and you're a nobody. Ah, uh, humble perfect. to the end. Perfect person. Yes. Sarah filed for divorce and was able to obtain custody of their daughter. And as punishment, Hubbard cleared out the bank accounts and left her and his child penniless. Like not even just going after his wife. I get, you know, bitterness in a relationship, whatever. This is his child. Like I'm going to my child will starve because fuck you. Exactly. Like, wow. Yeah. Hubbard would experience profound bouts of depression, self-doubt, paranoia, and anxiety. His increasingly grandiose persona masked a seething cauldron of insecurities. His disputed memoirs reveal a peak beneath the surface. The memoir, by the way, is publicly disputed by Scientology, though when it was submitted as evidence in a lawsuit, they changed their tune and argued that it was private and privileged and should thus be inadmissible. <laughs> so in his memoir, Hubbard wrote affirmations for himself, and they are both hilarious and revealing. Mm. quote it is not necessary for you to lie to be amusing and witty you like to have your intimate friends approve of and love you for what you are this desire to be loved does not amount to psychosis <laughs> you can sing beautifully <laughs> you will live to be 200 years old you will always look young you have no doubts about god you are not a coward <laughs> you have no fear of what any woman may think of your bed conduct Oh. You know you are a master. You know they will be thrilled. Many women are not capable of pleasure in sex, and anything adverse they say or do has no effect whatsoever upon your pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Read as, when you can't make all the women come, that's on them, though. I love that. He's like, you are a master. They will be thrilled. Yeah. But if they're not. It, but they will. But, but if but, they're not, but, it's not your bad. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance be thy name. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. I'm not incapable of pleasing women. They're just a bunch of frigid bitches. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. There is a whole lot of vibe that is incel here. Yeah. Just all over this. He is king incel. If if he were a master of anything, it would be incel. In fact, I might say, <gasps> have we discovered the first incel? It could be. He's, uh, this is patient zero. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. In cell zero all the way. Yeah. 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 It's so amazing to me too that he has clearly like a lot of insight as to his problems. Yeah. Because he's saying he's denying them so vigorously. Yeah. You were not a coward. Said no non coward ever. Said any brave person <laughs> ever. Hubbard further wrote a whole section of goals and compliments for himself. These are pretty amazing, too. Mm -hmm. uh, quote, you are radiant like sunlight. You are psychic. <laughs> you do not masturbate. Wait, hold on. Stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> you do not masturbate ever is a goal or a compliment? Which one is it? Was he clear on this? I'm pretty sure it was a goal. Because okay. we know. Mm, yeah. yeah. He had stiff socks. Ew. There are no snakes in the bottom of your bed. The fuck? Okay. That took a turn. Yeah. <laughs> that got bad quick. <laughs> like, that is, again, 5150, this motherfucker. Holy Jesus. Like, go don't masturbate in a facility. Yes. Like, you need to be radiating like sunlight and not masturbating in a padded room. Free of snakes because <laughs> there's no bed. So just lie down yeah. on the padded surface and you're good to go. There's never been a comforting expression of the sentiment, there are no snakes in the bottom of your bed. Like, because that means either you're crazy or you're in a situation and location where there might be <laughs> snakes in the bottom of your bed. Why the fuck are you on this <laughs> island? And why did you pitch your tent there? No, nah, never good. Birds know better. <sighs> so it's easy to see how a man with such extreme delusions, including delusions of grandeur, might be able to focus all of his intensity and creativity and charisma into manifesting some actual grandeur drawing acolytes into his gravitational orbit via the overwhelming power of unfiltered crazy. Mm. The law of attraction from the secret is not a real scientific phenomenon, but if you believe something strongly enough, it is certainly possible to get other people to believe that thing. Like, I'm not crazy, or... I don't masturbate. <laughs> I don't masturbate. <laughs> the least believable of all the things he said i more believe that there might be snakes at the bottom of his bed and that he radiates sunlight than right. that he doesn't matter so in 1953 hubbard cobbled together his extensive mailing list from the success of dianetics mashed together all of his science fiction mumbo jumbo and officially created scientology along with a ladder of steps that had to be completed on the path to going clear each of those steps required paying large sums of money to unlock more advanced techniques and the next set of increasingly ridiculous theories and supposed superhuman abilities. He called it a bridge, which makes zero sense because it is always represented vertically. It is definitely a ladder, mm. uh, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, for a man who believes there might or might not be snakes <laughs> under his bed, confusing bridge with ladder, cool, bro. We'll, we'll move on. Let's give you a pass. Yeah. So less than a decade after founding the church in the early 1960s, Hubbard applied for tax-exempt status and was initially denied. He fled from the United States with the IRS on his heels and would soon found the so-called Sea Organization. It was basically like he was trying to recreate his Navy service, but on a party cruise. Hmm. The Sea Organization initially consisted of three dilapidated vessels operating offshore in international waters. Members of the Sea Org crew had to sign a contract which stipulated that they pledged loyalty and their souls for the next one billion years. Quote, I do hereby agree to enter into employment with the Sea Organization and, being of sound mind, do fully realize and agree to abide by its purpose, which is to get ethics in on this planet and universe, and, fully and without reservation, subscribe to the discipline, mores, and conditions of this group and pledge to abide by them. That was a, I object to that on just grammar. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to get my <laughs> ethics in on this planet. I don't even, what? I don't even care about like that it's bonkers sounding. No. It's just also like grammatically wonky and I hate it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Listening to that made my earballs hurt. Come up with better legalese. Please. Therefore, I contract myself to the C organization for the next billion years. Unquote. Which is a number that only a truly crazy person would come up with on That's any sort of legal contract. The language of this contract should immediately nullify this contract. I'm pretty sure it does. Like, any claim to be of sound mind is kind of contradicted by the fact that you're signing up to live on a dirty boat for a billion years. Yeah, or just the energy part of you. Like, even, let's just assume some law considers the soul a thing. Then it's for a billion years? What? Well, because you would live multiple lives, and so Scientology would have you for all of them up to a billion years. After a billion years, you're good. 
you can you know you can stop swabbing the deck after a billion years because the boat's gonna last that long obviously it's just my point is like saying you're of sound mind does not make it true and no. is demonstrably false based on the action that you're involved in right now based on the action of you signing the document yeah it's meaningless yeah like, i being of sound mind do hereby stipulate that pigs shall fly and astroturf waffle catnip <laughs> just, <laughs> just as meaningful Hubbard would actually later stipulate that anyone who died was granted a 21-year leave of absence from the Sea Org and then <gasps> expected to return. You sweetums, you! 21 whole years? So death gave you, like, a vacation time. Yeah. That was your PTO. <laughs> you died. We expect, all right, you can die now. But, uh, you know, the clock starts today. We expect you back here in exactly 21 years. Don't make it 21 years in two days. Enjoy your death break. <laughs> This is the dumbest of all contracts because what you're essentially doing is encouraging suicide. Like on their third week, they're just like, oh God, I got to get the fuck out of here. And just diving over the fucking, you know, side with hundred pound weights to their ankles. Yeah, we'll talk about diving over the side, but I, I don't know. I mean, you only, that only gives you 21 years and you know, you have billions more to go. It almost makes it pointless to kill yourself. You're mm -hmm. like, ah, I could kill myself and get out of here. No, you can't. You only get 21 years and then you're back on the boat, buddy. I'd take the 21 year break, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep shooting myself. Every time I die, I get 20 more years. Yeah. So after every 21 years, I'm just fucking shooting myself in the head. Yeah, 21, 21 <laughs> years in one day, I'm just blam, and I'm back to it. Yeah, I mean, I would live to be 21 a billion times because, hey, that's those are the best years of your life anyway. I mean, I started drinking, having sex, and doing drugs when I was 14. Yeah. That's plenty of time to get some crazy shit in before you just swab the old lead bullet. Hubbard ran his fleet of three rickety ships as a full-on pirate-style dictator. He would even throw disobedient or inept crew members overboard. Jesus. Quote, students and crew were lined up on deck in the early hours every morning. They waited to hear whether they were on the day's list of miscreants. Those who knew they were would remove their shoes, jackets, and wristwatches in anticipation. The drop was between 15 and 40 feet, depending upon which deck was used. Sometimes people were blindfolded first, and either their feet or hands loosely tied. Non-swimmers were tied to a rope. <laughs> Non-swimmers? Like Jesus. people who couldn't swim? Yes. Or just people who refused to? They're like, no, I'm going for my 21 years. They're like, no, you're not. Fishing back. <laughs> Quote, being hurled such a distance, blindfolded and restrained into cold seawater, must have been terrifying. Worst of all was the fear that you would hit the side of the ship as you fell, your flesh ripped open by barnacles. Overboarding was a very traumatic experience, unquote. No fucking shit. Yeah, especially if you couldn't swim. I'm still not over that. That's yeah. I can't swim. We got a rope. We will <laughs> haul, we promise we'll haul you back up. You'll be fine, you great big girl. Also, <laughs> you couldn't swim and you signed up to be on a boat for a billion years? Yeah, you you are 18 different kinds of stupid. I don't I'm sorry. I have no sympathy for you because you're that dumb. That's just amazing. Imagine pulling yourself out of that like frigid water. They haul you back up with a rope or whatever. And then you head back to your cramped little filthy cabin and just putting another check mark on your calendar for the day. Just like 364 billion days to go. Jesus. <laughs> Hubbard would eventually tire of the sea life. He would sneak into Florida and spend the rest of his days in hiding, managing Scientology behind the scenes while dodging tax collectors. Mm. He worked super hard to try to make Scientology a legitimate religion, or at least to erase any arguments against it being a religion. Mm. For instance, the symbol of Scientology is 100% just a Christian cross with some spikies around the middle. Have you seen it? No. And he also forced auditors to wear priestly robes. So basically he was saying, like, if you attack Scientology and say it's not a religion, you're also attacking and questioning the validity of Christianity because we have all the same stuff. That is the same logic as going into, like, a you know, cosplaying convention and being like, not an elf. Not a thing, therefore Catholic doesn't exist. Like, yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? He was about? like Jesus LARPing. Yeah. <laughs> what? That's what they should have done with Hubbard. It's been like, all right, well, you think you're Jesus? Let's find out. <laughs> Open the cross with you. <laughs> you got three days. <laughs> we'll see you then. <laughs> Meanwhile, Scientology began to take hold in Hollywood. Early celebrity converts like Priscilla Presley and John Travolta raised the religion's profile. Travolta had been introduced to Scientology before he became famous by an actor friend, and after his first couple of auditing sessions, he started getting booked for commercials and then landed his big break in the sitcom Welcome Back, Cotter, 
and mistaking correlation for causation, he attributed his success to Scientology. Mm. But of course, success was the exception, not the rule, for wannabe Scientology actors. Most aspiring actors floundered into obscurity while sinking all of their money into additional trainings to move up the so-called bridge to total freedom. Right. The ladder. Right. Bridge. So the bridge ladder to total freedom is the path to enlightenment in Scientology. You start as a lowly standard human, but as you work your way up... And to the side. <laughs> as you cross the bridge vertically... <laughs> By paying for additional courses, you eventually reach the OT levels, and you have officially become an operating Thetan. Thetan refers to the soul, and as you moved up the ladder, your soul would begin operating on increasingly efficient levels, and you would supposedly begin developing those superhuman abilities, like telekinesis and telepathy. Mm. And moving up the ladder, horizontally, <laughs> is not just a matter of auditing and coursework. There is also the purification rundown, which consists of supplements and intense heat exposure. Basically sitting in saunas for hours until you've sweated out all of your pathetic mortality and achieved those superpowers. Yeah, and achieved a state of enlightened beef jerkitude. <laughs> Just fully desiccated. Yes. Yeah. Mm. The rundown, by the way, is still part of the process of becoming clear. It has been described as, quote, a controversial detoxification program, which involves heat exposure for up to five hours a day and can exceed four weeks in length. It is known to cause heat stroke damage, which includes brain injury, heart problems, organ failure, and death. 5,000 milligrams niacin doses also cause liver damage. The participant has a restricted diet, including large doses of vitamins and a teaspoon of salt, and would spend at least an hour a day jogging in a rubberized suit. There have been multiple deaths associated with the rundown. Not shockingly. <laughs> I would be shocked if there were not. I was gonna All these... <laughs> Beef jerky people sitting and taking niacin supplements and teaspoons of salt had not dropped dead. That would be weird. Yeah, if all these god jerky people didn't actually <laughs> drop dead and burst into flame, I'd be a little confused. Also, with each new level, more of the elaborate mythology and additional secrets would be divulged. Even though the top level was OT8, operating Thetan 8, OT3 is when you got access to the whole whiz-bang enchilada of crazy. That was when you get to read a stack of papers, handwritten by L. Ron Hubbard, which claimed to reveal the entire origin story of humanity. Hmm. So keep in mind that as a loyal Scientologist, at this point you've already invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in your journey up the sideways ladder bridge. <laughs> across the vertical bridge to enlightenment. Right. You know, these Scientologists are not stupid. They don't go full Xenu until you're all in. Mm. And that is by design, because if they busted out with this lunacy on day one, prospective members would run for the hills. No one is this crazy until you've been indoctrinated and spent hundreds of thousand dollars. And, you know, spent time trying to do God jerky, because at that point... <laughs> yeah, at that, at that point, you're a little loopy. So yeah. <laughs> they get you right on the way out. <laughs> Here, take this teaspoon of salt, and then I got some stuff to show you. <laughs> take this thousand milligrams of niacin here's a spoonful of salt and by the way read this while you're sweating out your asshole how many fingers am i holding up 25 all right you're ready <laughs> so this stack of papers that you get to read it is like one of those cans of nuts with coiled paper snakes inside it is shocking it's just mm. you can't imagine like reading this must have just been like your heart stops so you may have seen the incredibly ridiculous and 100% accurate encapsulation of the OT3 story in cartoon form on South Park. And they were not kidding. It is true. So brace yourself. We're going to cover it. Okay. Scientologists believe that 75 million years ago, a humanoid civilization was spread out among the stars. Yet strangely, life looked very much like it did in the 1960s when Hubbard was writing this story. <laughs> People wore the exact same clothes and drove the exact same cars, but they had elected an evil warlord named Xenu as ruler. As one does. Why, why is this weird to you? This makes total sense Also, to he's called a dictatorial warlord, but he, if he was, like, elected, like, that's that's on you. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a president. Yeah. We've had one of those in the last four years. politics. Yeah. And poor judgment. Y'all voted for Xenu. So to handle the problem of overpopulation, Xenu forced his citizens to show up at government headquarters for supposed tax audits, and once they were there, they would be frozen with injections of glycol to their hearts. It's a direct quote from L. Ron Hubbard. He, quote, boxed them up in boxes, threw them into space planes. The DC-8 airplane is an exact copy of the space plane of that day. Which is interesting because the DC-8, not a space plane. Yeah, and also, there's no such thing as a space plane. 
So I guess it wasn't an exact copy mm. of the DC-8, but, you know, whatever. Splitting hairs. Yes. Yeah. Splitting zeros. So those DC-8 not space planes, loaded with frozen interstellar humanoids, flew to the galactic prison planet, which we know today as Earth, but at that time was called Tegiak. Okay. <sighs> the planes dropped all of those frozen humanoid bodies into volcanoes. And then, for good measure, dropped some atom bombs on top of the volcanoes, on top of the humanoids. So it was like a volcano-humanoid bomb sandwich. At that point, all of the frozen souls were thawed by the subsequent boomsplodes and released into the air. And their free-floating alien spirits are called Thetans. Okay. The Thetans were then captured and forced to sit and watch 3D movies on what Hubbard described as uh, super-colossal screens. And these screens implanted visuals and images into their, like, spirit brains, I guess. I don't know. There's no point in questioning any of this. Yeah. So nowadays, when a human child is born, a bunch of thetans leap into its body, and those disembodied souls of ancestral alien intergalactic previously frozen and volcano-thawed humans are the cause of all of our strife and anxiety and stress. And only Scientology and the process of auditing can help you expel those thetans. Because we're not trying to, you know, placate the Thetans or allow them to rest easily or deal with the fact that there are millions and millions of disembodied souls floating miserably around our atmosphere through no fault of their own, having been tricked and frozen and blown up and persecuted as a result of a failed political system. But that's, you know, that's someone else's problem. Scientology just wants to get them out of you. Yes. That's what matters. Obviously. <sighs> yeah, I, I I wish I could say something good. I, I'm seriously just sitting here with apoplexy. I got nothing. What it reminds me of is the stupid shit I've written down or like, you know, written as song lyrics when I've been blackout drunk, woken up in the morning, read it and been like, oh God, I must burn this immediately. But instead of doing that, you tuck it away in a briefcase and then you lock it in a safe and then you give it to people when they've given you $150,000. I feel like, you know, he was just, he was so prolific and he wrote so fast that I don't think he remembered what it said. He was just like, oh, this is, this is gold. This I'm spinning gold. And he was Look sweating. Look my hands move. He was sweating all over his piece of paper. <laughs> nice and coming out of his eyeballs. <laughs> and he, then he just stuffed that in the briefcase and was like, yeah, give it to him. And someone read it and was like, you sure you want to edit this? Everybody. You want to like second draft or something? He was like, no, No perfect. blasphemer. <laughs> <laughs> Out of my study. Ah, oh, Lord. Yeah. Can you imagine going through all of that intensive, highly emotional auditing, all of these courses, paying all this money? It takes approximately $100,000 just to get clear. Mm. You're at least like 150000 in by the time you get to read this craziness. What I'm actually struggling with is that we don't hear more reports of murder, homicides, and or like massive gun shootings. Like just how do you leave that room having read that garbage and not go on a murderous rampage through a Scientology temple? Because they're already brainwashed. Like you said, like, you know, they're, they're niacin. You know, they've had you in the sauna for five weeks. So. Have you ever taken niacin? No. My my father used to take it because he thought it, it helped his circulation. And mm -hmm. so I took it one day. It feels like having a sunburn inside your skin. Mm -hmm. Like it is vastly uncomfortable. So imagine, let's call it an order of magnitude times so, that feeling. So it feels like being infested with Thetans. Yes. Thetans yeah. times Lore. Satan. Yes. <laughs> Thetan-y Satans all in your bloodstreams is, and then sweating your fucking brains out for five hours. For all of the grifting and obvious craziness of the church, it does seem that around the time L. Ron Hubbard wrote this stupid nonsensical gobbledygook, he was actually damaged enough to believe his own mythos. This was around the time that he started claiming that an extremely powerful and malevolent Thetan was inhabiting his body, and he employed some of his most trusted auditors and disciples to help him get it out. Toward the end of his life, he clearly suffered from delusions and paranoia. He was less of a cult leader and more of a liability. They were kind of hiding him away at the end. Mm. The real cult leader of Scientology, the guy behind the guy, he would come later. L. Ron Hubbard died of a stroke in 1986, leaving a power vacuum in the Church of Scientology. Now, of course, as soon as he died, the church panicked and held emergency meetings to figure out how to handle this announcement. Mm -hmm. Because after all, Scientology promised literal immortality to those who achieved the highest operating Thetan levels. And yet the most revered and accomplished Scientologist had just succumbed to pancreatitis. <laughs> it was decided that a massive meeting of Scientologists would be called and the death would be framed as Hubbard's choice. Hubbard had decided to discard his body and had moved on to a spiritual plane to research more uh, operating Thetan levels and would return with that info at some point, very Jesus-like. Mm -hmm. But not three days. More like 
three generations. At least 21 years. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. getting, he's taking a break. Yeah, yeah. He was on PTO. <laughs> he was on his C or PTO. So you've been on the planet 68 years? Yeah, that's about uh, three years PTO. So the man who would step into this power vacuum is someone that I firmly believe to be genuinely evil rather than delusional. Hmm. David Miscavige, the current leader of Scientology, is a sociopath. Some former Scientologists will claim that Miscavige is in fact a true believer, but I do not buy it one bit. Hmm. I think he is the worst kind of grifter because he absolutely knows that this is a scam and a cult, and he does not care. So let's talk about David Miscavige. He was not recruited to the church. He was inducted into the church by default in 1971 at age 11 when his parents joined Scientology. He would eventually become a kind of attack dog for the church. He was a huge believer in the philosophy of, quote, fair game, which is a Scientology principle stating that anyone who opposes or questions the church is an enemy and should be taken down via all available tactics. Enemies are fair game. I got it. Yeah. It just, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea that a church is like, no, no, no. No, no, no. Our enemies are all fair game. See, that's so easy, though, for a church to convince itself because you believe that you're on a righteous crusade, right? Mm. So A jihad, if it were. Right. So I don't give David Miscavige a pass because I don't think he's a true believer, but there are some people who are duped into this. Maybe they hadn't gotten to OT3 yet, so they <laughs> hadn't read the Xenu papers. But they still believed that they needed to save the world. Scientology talks about clearing the world, mm. which <laughs> sounds Pretty damn nefarious. Like Horrifying. They need to work on the messaging here. Yeah, yeah. It's still just crazy. I can't grasp it in this, but I, I got it. I got it theoretically. Just, ah. So perhaps the biggest fair game operation was waged against the IRS in an effort to bully the government into recognizing Scientology as a religion and grant it tax-exempt status. Scientologists infiltrated federal buildings and stole documents. They slashed tires. They went after anyone who painted them in a negative light. So even they poisoned the pets of journalists who wrote unflattering stories. It's intense. Wow. Now, as bad as Miscavige is, much of this actually started under Hubbard. So let's not let him fully off the hook here. Hubbard had created the infamous Rehabilitation Project Force, or RPF, located on the seventh floor of the Scientology Hollywood headquarters. Have you seen that huge blue building with the like... Sort of like a V? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a former hospital. It's like super bright blue. It has these giant wings. It could almost be a Kirkbride, like Batwing hospital. Yeah. Except more boxy and industrial and mostly more blue. Mm. The blueness is really the most striking element. That is its defining characteristic. It's like the same color as the heads of the blue man group. It's like that level of blue. I'm blue, hubberdy hubby died. Uh, it's heinous mm. and on the seventh floor that was where hubbard had created a basically a prison camp and miscavige would later confine members who were questioning their faith and they would then initiate the process of reindoctrination. it was a gulag a combination of a prison camp with intensive brainwashing yikes they would get five hours of auditing per day followed by hours of backbreaking labor no free time at all and you might ask yourself, like, why wouldn't these people just leave? This place was not technically a jail. Mm. Well, a few reasons. There's the fear of being excommunicated from the church, which is known as disconnection. People who leave the church would be shunned. They would be declared an SP or a suppressive person. Mm. So this still happens today. If the defector has information that is potentially dangerous to the church, they are harassed, followed, videotaped, stalked. And if all of that isn't enough of a reason to not get on the bad side of the church and to stay even when you know you should go, there is an even more practical reason. Remember all of that auditing when you were encouraged to explore the most sensitive memories of your childhood and divulge all of your secrets? Oh, God. Those sessions are meticulously recorded. Scientology is a giant, paranoid, powerful organization that knows all of your secrets. Uh, that is horrifying. All of your information is kept in what is called a PC, or pre-clear, folder. And Scientology has entire teams, like the Office of Special Affairs, dedicated to pouring over the PC folders of people who have left the church or are considered candidates for defection. So they can dig up incriminating or embarrassing or sensitive information. Just blackmail. Yeah. We thought Nexium was bad. Sweet. Yeah. Unjoy the Jesus. Like, that is, that's Nexium to the nth degree. Well, it's way worse than Nexium because it's way bigger than Nexium by far. That's what I mean. Like it's you... although now you know it's it's. I mean, twenty thousand people is pretty much nothing. That's like a s small soccer stadium or something. Right. I mean, you could literally fit all the Scientologists in the world easily in the Super Bowl, and they would just be in one cheering section. 
On October 1st, 1983, Scientology was officially deemed a religion by the IRS, and David Miscavige declared victory, holding a massive celebration in an auditorium with all the pageantry of a creepy Nazi rally. There were fireworks and giant gilded set pieces. It was as if they had won a literal war. It was very military. And I say unto you, with all of your Satans out of the way, why does that word sound like Satan? Never mind. With all of your Satans out of the way, we will conquer the world. Now go forth and don't pay taxes. Even when you have the candies and you go to the Safeway and you buy the candies, you don't pay taxes. You say, no, no, give me back my 15 cents, you bastard. We have won the war of itemized deductions and claiming of dependence. It, it was a tax war. Seriously. So Scientology now rakes in money from donations, and even L. Ron Hubbard's novels are considered scripture and are tax-exempt. On top of that, Scientology doesn't have to pay a living wage to uh, volunteers of organizations like the Sea Org, because they're a religion. Scientology is worth billions, and they are not required to give any of it back to the government. It is fucking infuriating. Yeah. Me. No, no religion should be tax exempt. None of them. It's all bullshit. But especially fucking Scientology, which is, you know, at least some religions pretend that they're giving back. Scientology is not giving shit. They're buying more buildings and leaving them empty. It is wasteful and shitty. And David Miscavige is just living the high life. It's fucking awful. Yeah, I, I, I cannot as you would say, sanction that buffoonery at all. If you're really, really into saving all of your quote-unquote God's children, then you at least want to invest in your God's children's government and your God's children's roads and your God's children's education. And yeah, kitty schmack. Yeah, I don't even understand. I don't understand the rationale. I've never understood the rationale. Why do religions not have to give something back? That's their whole function is to better society so why are we not using some of their resources to better society that's what they're supposed to be doing anyway right so a little bit more about miscavige Mm -hmm. he is infamous for violently abusing his staff like striking them kicking them also verbal abuse he's not a big guy he is smaller than tom cruise when they're side by side but he is a mean little bastard with a napoleon complex he has forced people to lick the floor sentenced them to isolation he has forced them to fight for his approval. It is like Machiavellian. Jesus. In one shocking incident, he arranged a game of musical chairs for some of his highest ranking lieutenants, and he decreed that anyone who ended up without a chair would be ejected from the organization, declared a suppressive person, and disconnected from the church and all of their friends and family. So it was brutal. They just like tore each other apart over chairs. This is a moment where I feel like I, I, I want to be able to speak in memes because I want that thing. That, but why? Like, were they all people who were like, you know, somehow, uh, you know, suspected of being suppressive persons? And they were he was just doing like the, you know, untouchables, uh, you know, going around the thing with a bat, like the table or the bat. Like, what was he doing? There was, was an the element point? of like paranoia and him accusing them all of being traitors and blah, blah, blah. But really, it was just a power trip. He was doing the, the thing where he like literally... You know, here's a bunch of people, throw a knife in the middle and be like, all right, like one of you gets to walk out of here. I mean, it's just chaos. We'd like you to join this organization. There's room for aggressive expansion. Throw that fucking pool cue in the fucking middle of those two guys. Yeah, it's super villain level craziness. Like, here's another example. His wife, Shelly Miscavige, she supposedly, quote, withdrew from public life in 2007 and has not been seen since. Huh. Multiple missing persons report have been filed and the police, they claim that they have contacted her or someone claiming to be her and that she expressed that she simply has no interest in like leaving the house or talking to anyone ever, her friends and family. It is insane. This little fucker clearly killed or imprisoned his wife and has gotten away with it. And feel free to sue me, Scientology. They love to sue people, mm. but prove I'm lying by producing your fucking wife. They I know they won't sue me because right. they don't want to they don't want to touch that. Right. They want to touch everything else, but like you talk about Shelly Miscavige and they're like we don't know. Yeah. I, <clears throat> we don't. <clears throat> Mutter. <laughs> Zenu uh, Thetans and uh, <clears throat> uh, bridges go upwards and, and sideways. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the wife you were looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> So let's end this by talking about the state of Scientology today and where it's headed in the future. Mm. I mentioned the Scientology website in the beginning, and on that website, you can watch every episode from the Scientology television network, 
which is also an app that you can download onto your Apple TV or Direct TV, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I watched it. It is honestly really well made. Mm-hmm. It is high budge. On our Patreon version of this episode, I'm going to play some clips from what I watched. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I mentioned I'm not scared of Scientology uh, when it comes to Shelley Miscavige. But mm. they will sue your ass for pretty much anything else. So that'll be on the Patreon version, and I'll just describe these clips on our regular feed. Sweet. Yeah. So the first episode I watched, it, it just starts off with David Miscavige telling you what you can expect from Scientology. And I would encourage, if anyone's interested, go just watch this. You can get a sense of this guy. He's very intense, and, like, he just freaks me the fuck out. Mm. So he highlights all of their property, all of the money. That's what really comes across is the absolute luxury that Scientology is capable of flaunting. There are lots of pretty faces in these videos. David Miscavige has excellent hair. Uh, (laughs) His eyes, I'm assuming, were digitally enhanced because they are like creepily blue. Everyone's eyes just pop. It's Mm. very weird. Like they did a lot of video post-production. In some of these videos, you're invited uh, behind the scenes where the church has an entire media production arm creating basically propaganda videos. There is a whole TV series called Meet a Scientologist and another called Voices for Humanity, which highlights the church's humanitarian outreach, which is really just uh, trying to convince people to become Scientologists. Right. I was going to say, which is non-existent except for recruitment. (laughs) They have a TV show called Freedom TV. That's another one, which very QAnon sounding, Mm. featuring investigative journalism, question mark. (laughs) Question mark, exclamation point, I feel. That is just a bunch of brainwashed cultists doing their own research. Right. That is not investigative journalism. Like you're going to be uncovering the dirty secrets of organizations around the world, but you are in the dirtiest of organizations. I'm pretty sure. Top three, at least. There are some great segments in these videos. The supposed pro athlete I've never seen before who claims that he couldn't breathe correctly before Scientology. Uh, Apparently, Scientology does not just clear your soul. It clears your sinuses. (laughs) And the woman who claimed that Scientology and Scientology techniques saved her marriage, which is amazing. I mean, especially considering its history, which is not a whole lot of marriage saving. Paranoia and abuse, the cornerstones of any healthy marriage. Indeed. And if you have any doubts about the efficaciousness of our treatments, please look at our poster boy, Tom Cruise, who has been married umpteen times, none of whom stay with him longer than a couple of years on purpose. And all of whom leave the church. So, yes. Yeah. Did I mention all the money? That is like, again, that is just what really comes across. It is mind boggling when watching the videos, how much property and money they fucking have. Like, half of the footage is stock video, just of smiling, diverse, pretty people standing in front of sunsets and frolicking on the beach or whatever. Mm. But the other half is just religious bling on display. These Scientology centers, like the purification center that you get to tour in one episode, they are lavish, high-tech, modern, state-of-the-art. Those e-meters, they're not a couple of soup cans anymore. Now they're called spiritual technology, and they look like something designed by aliens. Just all streamlined, molded, plastic and steel, just... Super smooth and blinky. Let me guess, they lock too, around your wrists and ankles? They don't. You're still just holding these, but they're just not cans anymore. It looks like the things that you hold to check your pulse when you're on the you know, elliptical. That's basically what they are, too. Yeah. The church is much more savvy and slick than they used to be. Uh, however, it is clear from watching these videos that fundamentally they are still the same old bigoted, crazy science fiction cult. Mm. For instance, they've softened their official rhetoric on homosexuality, but they now place a huge emphasis on family values and the importance of reproduction in a relationship, which is basically just an anti-gay dog whistle. Right. And I mentioned those purification centers. They're still pushing dangerous detox regimens. I will play a clip in the Patreon version of a guy who literally believes that he is sweating out drugs from years ago. He's like, I have not smoked weed in five years, and yet I could smell marijuana when I was sweating. That's the depth of the sweating that he thinks he's achieved, that he's sweating out five years ago weed. Uh, olfactory hallucination. Thy name is Niacin. If you do watch some of this, and I didn't really pay attention to this, but I should have because I listened to a podcast from a woman who briefly joined Scientology. Uh, She was planning to create like an expose and then sort of didn't. Mm. But she did create one uneven but occasionally interesting podcast. And she claims that she had infiltrated Scientology, but really she just took a tour of one of the recruitment centers, which anyone can do because that's what a recruitment center is for. Mm -hmm. But they try to impress you there with this lavish setting. and, And then they give you a test, which reveals how disappointingly average and unremarkable you are without the benefit of Scientology in your life. Mm. And she also talks about the fact that they are coached not to blink 
or to blink as little as possible, and they maintain eye contact. And just note in the video just how creepy this is once you notice it, that people are just <laughs> wide-eyed staring and refusing to break eye contact. It's very unsettling. Yes, Duncan is uh, attempting to make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, I do, as we have established, I do have an axe on my side of the room, so <laughs> this is not going to be super successful. Not too worried. Do you want me to get the axe? <laughs> I'll, I'll get the X, Duncan. I'll get the X. It's a hatchet. So if you watch any Scientology stuff or drop by the recruitment center, just be on the lookout for that. Mm. Just watch for the lack of blinking. Maybe you can just have a staring contest with them and they won't even know it, but they'll figure out after a while because they're like, <laughs> holy, holy shit, this person has clearly been schooled in, the, in our ways. <laughs> My favorite part of the podcast, by the way, was how she described the test takers. Uh, she described them as testies. Like they're <laughs> testers and testies. <laughs> Which struck me as way more funny than it should. I yeah, the ten year old nest just coming out. She's I don't remember exactly what she said, but she was like, The testes were disappointed to learn that they were living average, unremarkable lives, which only Scientology could improve. The testes were disappointed to find out they were living darkened and shadowed <laughs> lives, stuck between two columns of doubt and disbelief. I would be constantly disappointed with my plight if I were some testes. <laughs> It is not a dignified position. It really is, and I sit on my testes at least once a week. So that is Scientology. There's so much more, but um, but it's been long enough. I'm getting I'm getting punchy. Holy crap! Get a little niacin around the uh, edges, <laughs> edges there. Yeah, it's really I feel as though I've been sitting in a hot box for five fucking hours. Well, we made it through that one, and I'm glad my throat held out. This mm. was I was actually a kind of a throat problem here, but by the grace of Zenu, we made it through. Two hours or something of this freaking episode. Holy crap. And, you know, I wish I feel like I benefited from this episode, but really all I learned was, oh, sweet Jeebus. You know what the benefit is? There's yeah. only like 20,000 of these fuckers. Yeah. It's not that big. It, it, it's just crazy how much money and power they have and influence based on the fact that they are basically just a club of rich people. Yeah. Well, they're a small club of rich people taking money from a medium-sized pool of sad, exploited people. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of like America writ small. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> all the, it's like a corporation. It's yeah. just a corporation. Yeah. So uh, take that as a hint. Um, if you folk, we need to all band together and wipe out Scientology. Um, They're going to wipe themselves out. I'm not even going to just, you know what? Ignore them because I think they hate that more than anything. Yeah. Just like their paranoid leaders. If you ignore them, they will just self-destruct. If you want to join a cult, join the cult of Miffy. Word. And speaking of which, we have some new patrons. Oh, shit. I want to thank Shauna and Deborah and Mariajo and Georgia and uh, my mom joined. That was cool. And my aunt Jackie, uh -huh. uh, who also helped raise me. So that's that's how you know you're killing it in the in when, the podcast game when a percentage of your supporters have changed your diaper on at least one occasion. That is that success. I think I almost did that one time, but it was more your underwear. <laughs> how drunk was I? Pretty. Do we have any reviews to read, or is that an after midnight we thing? We do. We can read a quick review. Here's one that just says, So funny. I love these guys. They always make every topic more interesting with their commentary. And that was S.M. Bauer from the United States. Thank you, S.M. Bauer. Appreciate it. So, as per usual, and for every time we've ever talked about this, please go to Instagram. We now have a Patreon. You can either go from tiny, small amounts of money a month to, you know, Slightly more amounts of money a month. You know, a couple Starbucks. And join our Discord. I won't always go rogue and disqualify the Discord input. I will. I do take that seriously. So we will get to the uh, topic that has already been chosen or voted on. There's actually still, I think it's still between a couple of them, but mm. one of them is pulling away. So do go vote for that. And then pretty soon there will be another poll up. So do join our Discord. Jump in and uh, join the conversation. Make your voice heard. And otherwise, and forever after. Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. And fuck Zeno.